Hello and welcome to this review of the IBM Selectric Typewriter. I've been wanting to show you one of these for a long time because, ladies and gentlemen, today we hit keyboard genesis. The IBM Selectric was one of the first steps toward a computer printer because it included an early digital to analog converter system and it's a very interesting device in and of its own. Compared to earlier, purely mechanical typewriters, which used separate type bars for every single character, the Selectric used a very clever mechanism based around a rotating golf ball to print the characters with. The idea behind it was pieced together from several previous devices, but was ultimately an incredible success as it alone took over three quarters of the entire typewriter market in just a few years. Along with the personal computer, it was one of those legendary IBM success stories. The Selectric system had the advantages of being very fast, very reliable and very flexible by virtue of its fascinatingly clever mechanism. The golf ball, called a typing element, had all the characters on it and it could be replaced by others in seconds to yield radically different character sets, fonts, italicized letters, etc. It was a typing revolution. I do have a Selectric 2 of my own, which I bought from the recycling center for 50p, but unfortunately even after reattaching a cable, it had originally been cut off, it doesn't really work because when you try to switch it on, it does this. Which is really not at all the way it's supposed to sound, oh dear. So I borrowed this working one from someone in the Dutch keyboard community after I spotted it at a meetup. It's a rare occasion that someone brings along something older than my stuff, and now I can finally show you one. Two of the biggest differences with a more traditional type bar typewriter is that instead of the whole carriage moving, with the Selectric is just the typing head moving. And second, while the Selectric is a 100% mechanical device, it does require mains electricity to power the device's operation. It's just a motor running though, there's no electronics involved as we would know it. The operation does revolve around digital or binary encoding to print the characters though, and that's why it laid the groundwork for computer printers that followed later. Every character composes a 6-bit set of mechanical data which is converted to analog output using two digital to analog converters hidden in the mechanism. The two converters control tilt and rotation which are necessary to maneuver the ball into the correct position for printing. As you can see, the ball has four rows on it and generally 22 columns, with the home row being the top one and the home column the one being indicated by the arrow here. That makes zero the home character, which means all the machine has to do in order to print a zero is move forward and it will strike a zero onto the paper. However, if it wants to print E R O P, it needs to tilt itself backwards before striking. If it wants to print uh, 7, 5, 2, 6, 4, 8 or something like that, it needs to rotate first and then strike. And if it wants to do any of the other characters, it needs to do a combination of both. The tilt and rotation is done by two cables connected to pulleys that tug on a pulley on the type head by a precise amount. Tugging on one cable tilts the head, and therefore the ball, and tugging on the other rotates it. The amount of tugging needed is controlled by a device called a whiffle tree, which is inside the machine, and which basically distributes forces throughout a set of linkages. There's two such trees, the simpler left tree controls tilt, and the more complicated one, the right controls rotation. The rotation one is more complex because obviously there's more different rotation values than there are tilt values, of which there are only four. Let's start with how the tilt one works. This is the tilt mechanism. The whiffle tree in the bottom is tugged by a certain amount, which in turn causes the tilt lever to tug on the tilt cable, which tilts the type head by the desired amount of rows. The whiffle tree is controlled by two selector latches, which are asymmetrically connected to a cross lever. Now the idea is that when you pull on one of the selector latches, the cross lever moves down by a certain amount, which in turn pulls on the tilt lever by part of the distance that the selector latch was pulled. 
If you pull on the other latch, the shorter distance to the linking point compared to that with the other latch results in a steeper angle and the tilt lever will be pulled downward twice as far as is the case with the other selector latch. Finally, if you tug on both selector latches, the whole assembly is yanked down by the full amount equal to the magnitude of pull of both separate latches. In other words, the system is a 2-bit binary machine. If you don't tug on either, the ball isn't tilted at all. If you tug on the right one, the cable is tugged by a third of a unit and the ball is tilted by one row. If you tug on the left one, the cable is tugged by two thirds of a unit and the ball is tilted by two rows. And if you tug on both, the cable is tugged by a whole unit and the ball is tilted the maximum amount of three rows. Something similar works for the rotation mechanism except it's more complicated as it needs to allow for more different rotation operations. It's made up of three trees instead and with different distance ratios, 5 to 5 for the first one, 3 to 2 for the second one and 2 to 1 for the third one. When you tug these pulleys you respectively get zero units of pull and no rotation, one fifth a unit of pull and one column of rotation, two fifths units of pull and two columns of rotation, three fifths of pull and three columns, four fifths of pull and four columns, and one unit of pull and five columns. The fourth pulley inverts the rotation allowing you to access the characters on the other side of the home column instead and they're rotated by the amount dictated by the other three selector latches. With one home column and five rotation columns to either side, that's 11 columns, half of what's on the ball. The other 11 columns are accessed using the shift key, which furthermore tugs the ball in such a way that it rotates 180 degrees, allowing you to access the second hemisphere of the typing element for a total of 22 columns. Of course, the characters are placed such that the capital letters are all on the opposite side of the ball. Now, each key obviously has a two-part binary code associated with it, one for tilt and one for rotation, but how does it transfer that information? How does the motor drive the typing motion? And how does the actual selector mechanism work? Well, basically the selector latches are hooked behind a latch bail plate which is pulled down when the latch bail is pushed down when the rotating cam rolls over the roller. When this latch bail plate is pushed down, any selector latches still latch the plate will be pulled down and selected, as it were, unless they got pulled out from under the plate by the key switch mechanism. Now every key consists of a button which is perched atop a hinged key lever which is in turn connected to an interposer which can move sideways short distances before it's retained by an interposer securing rod. As the interposer is pressed down, it pushes down on a cycle bail, which in turn pushes down on the cycle clutch latch pole, which is then pushed below the cycle clutch keeper and pulled forward by a spring, and in doing so the whole system is tilted, which allows the cycle clutch latch to disengage the cycle clutch sleeve, which allows the cycle shaft to rotate. This allows the motor driving the machine to connect to the cycle shaft, which in turn allows rotation of the filter shaft, which pushes against the end of the interposer. The interposer is a set of six selector lugs at the bottom which are used to push against any amount of six selector bales, each of which is connected to a latch interposer which in turn is the element that hooks into the selector latches discussed before which pull down on the respective whiffle trees and linkages which in turn pull on the tilt and rotation cables which control the typing head on which sits the golf ball. Simple, right? So, in short, basically every key uses a unique interposer which selects a unique set of latch interposers to pull on a unique set of whiffle tree linkages. It's a purely mechanical version of a 6-bit computer plus another bit for shifted characters. I should be clear by now, it's absolutely hideously complicated and it took me some studying before I fully understood it and this translates to its maintenance. The machine was so complex that people's jobs revolved around only repairing Selectrix. You had to study a whole course in order to be able to learn how one worked, let alone how to service it and it was a highly specialized thing to be trained at. A large part of IBM's revenue from these things came from maintenance and servicing contracts because no one was daft enough to even try and repair one themselves. I mean, where do you even start? That said, these machines were very reliable in the field and allowed a high typing speed and associated productivity. I know the mechanism sounds very slow, but typing a letter actually only takes a fraction of a second. Now 
about one thing that limited the type bar based typewriters of old, which in fact we owe the QWERTY layout to, is that when multiple keys are pressed, or they were pressed too quickly in succession, the bars could clash and hook into each other, which would jam the typing mechanism. This could greatly slow down operation. The way the selector got around that was by using a row of ball bearings in a race which only had enough space between them for one interposer, so that you could only press one at the same time. This is a very interesting case of what's essentially mechanical single key rollover. This mechanism is also blocked when the machine is not powered, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to borrow a working one, as my broken one will not type anything, so I couldn't show it in action or even comment on the key feel. This particular one though is an insanely good nick with no visible wear anywhere apart from the padding foam on the inside which invariably rots, but it works great. It even still had a whole bunch of things with it such as other typing elements, including the dummy element, the manual which was very useful, and an IBM Selectric poster. A catalog which shows that this is probably a model 196C in raven black, although you could also get autumn red, marlin blue, laurel green and sandstone beige, as well as a whole bunch of other models and different typing elements. A whole bunch of spare parts including an IBM branded brush, and finally an IBM desk cloth and <laughs> an actual IBM tie. Personally, I really love cool shit like this. It makes an already fantastic machine even more awesome. The keyboard itself has some cool extra features as well, such as a double width typing ribbon so that it would type characters on two rows and therefore last longer, as well as a corrector which moved you back one unit and ready the corrector ribbon, which, if you type the same letter again, would more or less literally pluck the letter off the paper again. This works surprisingly well, by the way. So now for the thing you've all been wondering about, what's the key feel like? Well, compared to my Remington, which is a type bar driven typewriter, it's much lighter. I've been told that this Remington is exceptionally stiff for a typewriter, and originally I had it set to the stiffest setting as well, but the Selectric is much nicer and lighter, and in contrast to the Remington, it actually feels more like a computer keyboard, whereas the Remington feels like a typewriter. Now I've reviewed tons of IBM keyboards before, including the venerable Model M which permeated the 90s and late 80s, and the Model F from the early 80s that came before it, and the Beam Springs from the 70s which came before that. And every time I reviewed one of those I mentioned that we were getting one step closer to keyboard genesis, and basically this is what I was getting at, this is as far back as it goes. But is it better? So let's compare it to a beam spring, an extremely excellent class of keyboards from the 70s. These keyboards were designed to emulate typing on a typewriter precisely like the Selectric, because that was what everybody was used to at the time. Now the fact of the matter is that the two key fields are very different, almost incomparably so. Beam springs basically become gradually stiffer with a small but sharp tactile dip in the mechanism. There's 4 millimeters of travel in total, a top weight of around 55 grams, and the switch feels extraordinarily smooth. The Selectric's force curve shows that it's stiffer at around 2.5 ounces, which is around 70 grams in real units, and much more tactile at a bump over 40 grams, making it about 4 times as tactile as Cherry MX Blue. The travel is about 0.22 inches or 5.6 millimeters in units that do make sense, which is extremely deep. But most importantly, the key feel shows a bizarre pattern more complex than that of any key feel I've seen to date, with a graph outlining the key lever spring, interposer latch spring, and interposer return spring events and how they affect key feel, as well as the more grindy top action of the ball interlock and the tactile dip, which is where the mechanism more or less knocks the key out from under you, which is rather interesting. Now, I'll be honest, when you actually try the key feel out, none of this is particularly apparent. There's a very long dead travel in which nothing at all happens, and then a non-linear stiffing, and then a tactile bump, 
which is largely glossed over by the action of the machine, which is so violent that it shakes up the whole machine and makes it a bit hard to notice specifics here. This must be the first time that the tactility mainly stems from the keyboard actually jumping up at you, rather than an inherent tactile element in the key switch design. And finally, of course, there's the sound. Now, typewriters are loud, which is why IBM actually put a solenoid in beam spring keyboards to make them louder. That way, they kind of emulate the noise level of typewriters. And in that video, I mentioned that the beam spring was kind of terrifyingly loud with the solenoid on. But now let's look at the Selectric at the same settings and same level of sound gain. The noise is ever so slightly dampened if you lower the case, but it's still deafening. I mean, holy shit, can you even imagine a room full of people typing on these? Well, anyway, that's it for this review. I hope you enjoyed it. It was quite an in-depth one this week. Next week, we're back to normal and following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard. I mean, typewriter. <laughs>